Greetings, nerdlings, and welcome back to part two of energy, enzymes, and metabolism. Today, we're going to be focusing on enzymes. So enzymes are proteins, and they act as catalysts to accelerate a reaction. A catalyst is something that speeds a reaction up. They are not permanently changed in this process, meaning after an enzyme catalyzes one reaction, it can go on to catalyze another. Enzymes are specific for what they will catalyze, and they are reusable, which means that, for example, the enzyme lactase can only catalyze the reaction of the breakdown of the sugar of lactose. It can't break down hydrogen peroxide or any other type of sugar. It can only break down lactose sugar. So enzymes are specific. They end in ACE for the most part. Some enzymes like pepsin don't. There's always one or two things that are confusing in biology. So for an enzyme, we have a substrate. This is not part of the enzyme as of yet. The substrate is what needs to be catalyzed, either broken down or put together. The enzyme itself has an active site, which is where the substrate will bind to eventually. So how do enzymes work? They work by lowering the activation energy, which is the energy needed to start a reaction. So for example, paper is made up of cellulose. Cellulose burns in the presence of oxygen. However, it will not burn unless you light a match and start a fire. I'm not going to just hold up a piece of paper and have it spontaneously combust into flames in my hand. We have to have a catalyst in this in this instance, it's going to be a lighter lighting a fire on that paper that ignites this reaction and the entire paper will burn up. The way enzymes catalyze reactions or speed those reactions up is by lowering the activation energy, meaning the energy needed to get that reaction started. So if you look right here, this is an example of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. A non-enzyme catalyzed reaction is right here, and it takes a lot more energy. So here we go with another example. Without the enzyme, this is what our activation energy is. All right. When we add the enzyme in, it lowers the amount of energy that we have to use to get that reaction started. Now we produce the same products, and eventually we'll get there, but with enzymes, those reactions occur much quicker. So the enzyme substrate complex. The substance or reactant an enzyme acts on is called a substrate. So if you look right here, this is called a substrate. The substrate is then going to bind to the active site of the enzyme. The enzyme will then do its magic. In this particular instance, it's going to be adding water through the process of hydrolysis, which is a rare catabolic reaction, meaning that we are scratching those bonds apart. So this enzyme is going to break the substrate into monomers. So eventually, after it breaks it, the enzyme will release the substrate, and the cell will be able to use this for whatever it needs. A restricted region of an enzyme molecule which bonds to the substrate is called the active site. So the active site of the enzyme is right here. This is where the substrate binds. <clears throat> so here we go with our substrate binding into the active site of the enzyme. So what are factors that affect enzyme activity? We have temperature, pH, cofactors and coenzymes, inhibitors, inhibitors are things that stop a reaction from occurring. So the word inhibit means to stop. Substrate and enzyme concentration also affects the activity of the enzyme itself. So temperature and pH. High temperatures are the most dangerous reactions and those denature the enzymes. So when I say the word denature, enzymes are proteins. Proteins have specific conformations or shapes that they have to go into in order to be effective. When we add extreme heat 
or extreme cold, or we add a very, very strong acid or base, it causes all of those bonds to break down, and we say that that denatures the protein. So this protein can no longer function. Most enzymes function at about body temperature, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and about 37 degrees Celsius. Most enzymes also like a near neutral pH, somewhere between 6 and 8, water being a pH of 7. So the effective temperature on enzymes. If you look right here, we're talking about an enzyme. This enzyme, if you look at the graph, is most active at about 37 or 38 degrees Celsius. If it gets too hot though, the enzyme activity drastically drops off because that enzyme is denaturing. And again, denaturing means that that protein, which an enzyme is a protein, all of those bonds are being broken down and it goes back into its primary structure. So the effective temperature on enzymes. For most enzymes, the optimum temperature is about 30 degrees Celsius. Many are a lot lower. For example, cold water fish will die at 30 degrees Celsius because their enzymes denature. Their enzymes are used to extreme cold temperatures, so that poor little fish is going to die if you bring it into warmer water. Its body will no longer be able to function. There are also other extremes of high temperature. So there are bacteria that have enzymes that can withstand very high temperatures of up to 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point. These bacteria can be found in geysers, like at Yosemite, and also hydrothermal vents that are found really deep in the ocean at divergent boundaries. Most enzymes, however, are fully denatured at 70 degrees Celsius. So optimum pH values. Like I was saying in the previous slide, some enzymes can function at extreme temperatures or extreme pHs. An example of an enzyme such as that is pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that's found in our stomach. Our stomach is extremely acidic. So if you look, this enzyme functions the best at about a pH of 1.5 to 2, which is extremely acidic on the pH scale. This enzyme actually starts to denature at a near neutral temperature of 7, or excuse me, a new neutral pH of 7. Trypsin, a different enzyme, is going to be optimum at about 8. Trypsin is completely denatured at the optimum value of pepsin. So the effective pH. Again, extreme pre pH levels will produce denaturation, meaning that protein is going to break down and enzymes are proteins. The structure of the enzyme is changed and the active site is distorted and the substrate molecules will no longer fit into it. At pH values slightly different from the enzyme's optimum value, small changes in the charges of the enzyme and its substrate molecules will occur. This change in ionization will affect the binding of the substrate with that active site. So what else affects enzymes? Cofactors and coenzymes. Inorganic substances such as zinc, iron, and vitamins, respectively, are sometimes needed for proper enzymatic activity, meaning they help enzymes out. So reading the label of my energy drink, I see some vitamins on here. I see vitamin B6 and vitamin B12. So those might help enzymes out in catalyzing reactions. But as far as ingredients go by themselves, it has zero calories, zero grams of sugar, zero carbohydrates, zero grams of protein, and zero grams of fat. So technically, this doesn't have any energy that I can readily use in my body. So for example, Iron must be present in the structure of hemoglobin in order for it to pick up oxygen. Hemoglobin is the protein found in red blood cells. So there are different types of inhibitors, and remember, the word inhibit means to stop. There are competitive inhibitors, and there are non-competitive inhibitors. 
Competitive inhibitors are chemicals that resemble an enzyme's normal substrate and they compete for the active site. So for example, if this is our normal substrate and this is the active site of our enzyme, we form our enzyme substrate complex. And competitive inhibitor would be something like this that binds with the enzyme's active site and it takes this, the place of the actual substrate. So the substrate can no longer bind to the active site. Therefore, the reaction doesn't occur. A non-competitive inhibitor means that they don't enter the active site, but they bind to another part of the enzyme, causing the enzyme to change its shape. This will in turn alter the active site. So for example, non-competitive inhibitor is not gonna bind with this active site. It's going to bind somewhere else on the enzyme and it will change the shape of the enzyme. So once the shape of the enzyme is changed, our substrate over here is going to try and bind, but nothing can happen because the enzyme can no longer catalyze the reaction. So here we have again our example of competitive versus non-competitive. Up here is a normal reaction. We have our substrate, which is binding to the active site. It forms a substrate enzyme complex. The enzyme breaks that substrate down into monomers that the cell can use. So this is a hydrolysis reaction. Hydro meaning water and lysis meaning to split apart. So in that reaction, we are splitting that substrate apart using water. And we call that a catabolic enzymatic reaction. Down here we have inhibition and this is a competitive inhibitor. It has the same shape that will fit into the active site. So it binds with the active site and it doesn't let this poor little substrate over here bind to the active site. So the reaction cannot occur and the substrate won't be broken down into parts that it can use. A non-competitive inhibitor changes the shape of the enzyme so that the substrate right here would no longer be able to fit into it. So substrate concentration also affects enzyme activity. An increase in the velocity is proportional to the substrate concentration. So the more substrate there is, the higher the reaction velocity is going to go. However, eventually it's going to level off. So the faster the reaction goes, the faster enzymes can catalyze those substrates. But eventually, all of the enzymes are going to be occupied. So at one point in time, all of the enzymes are going to have a substrate that they're catalyzing. Once all of the enzymes are full, the substrate is going to have to wait for an enzyme to finish catalyzing its reaction before it can catalyze another one. So substrate concentration can also affect enzyme activity. If you alter the concentration of the enzyme, then the maximum velocity will change too. So if I had a higher enzyme concentration, that could affect it as well. If there are more enzymes than substrates, the level of the activity is going to be level as well. So we have an induced fit hypothesis. This means that some proteins slightly alter their shape or their conformation to fit around their substrate. So when a substrate combines with an enzyme, it induces a change in the enzyme's conformation. The active site is then molded into the precise conformation, making the chemical environment suitable for the reaction. The bonds of the substrate are stretched to make the reaction easier and it lowers the activation energy. So induced fit hypothesis. So right here we have hexokinase with and without glucose substrate. So it slightly alters its shape for this glucose, gives it a nice little hug. And that's exactly what this enzyme does here. When the, when the substrate is entering, it slightly, whoops, it slightly alters the shape of the enzyme, and then the enzyme kind of hugs that substrate. It conforms to the substrate. So this explains that enzymes can react with a range of substrates in similar types. So this concludes our lecture over enzymes, energy, and metabolism. I hope you learned something.
I'll see you guys next time.